this whole floor is about the story and development of uh, lace. Interestingly, the the women who first added lace to the um, Kabaya were the Dutch or Eurasian women in Batavia. We know that from written records from the late 18th century, lace was described as being added to the to the Kabaya. Um, these are very important examples to tell the story because uh, if you come closer and please step forward to have a look, you will see that in terms of the construction, they are exactly like the Baju Panjang or the, those older kabayas with the, the gussets on the side and uh, also with these uh, uh, seams here, the lapel seams, but with added uh, bits of uh, rotary anglaise or lace or kind of um, different sort of deputy stitching techniques. At the same time, um, from the 1850s, a lot of um, European women started to um, produce their own batiks and this I think is also a response to the decline of the Indian trade cloth. So you, you see the same, uh, these new kinds of batik uh, with these floral designs and it takes off into a new di direction and these batiks were made especially for European and Eurasian women as well. But the, also the old historical uh, motifs such as the, the sawtooth patterns, um, geometric designs but, uh, produced in Java on European machine-made cottons. On the walls we have very very rare examples from Dutch museums. Um, these were made in 1850 by um, uh, uh, a Dutch woman of uh, German ancestry called Carolina von Frankemont and they, were, and they date to about 1850 and she produced these very fine hand-drawn batiks for the European and Eurasian for European and Eurasian clientele as well as uh, yeah uh, as well as local, the local Javanese community and Chinese Pranakans but, um, these you will see from the geometric patterns and these sort of floral designs, they echo back to the early Indian textiles as well. Then uh, we move to this next area and we come to the 1890s and 1900s and uh, European women in the colonies wore, you know, the kabaya, the shape became much more form-fitting and then uh, we see that the town of Pekalongan in North Java, on the north coast of Java, developed as, as, as a center for European batik, which we call batik Belanda, Belanda being the Malay word for the Dutch. And uh, they, they ladies began to sign the batik, so th these are all signatures. Um, and then you s see increasingly m varied motifs appearing, for example, blue and white cloths were made, were worn by Dutch or Eurasian brides on their wedding night and they were dressed in these uh, on their death and you know, as the last costume they wore in the coffin. This example, classic, it has the same Christian symbol, the faith, hope and charity, the cross, the heart and the anchor, and which would have been appropriate symbols for, for a young bride. Um, women were advised to wear to own up to a couple of dozen kabayas uh, and women travelling from from Europe or from Holland switched to kabaya once they port, crossed Port Said as they went to the tropics on the ships they changed from the European outfit to Saro kabaya um, this also points to note a lot of the the terms for like lace like renda and we have uh, Biku, these are all Portuguese words that have entered the Malay language. So Kabaya Renda, Renda is lace. Uh, then we see a lot of echoes from the Indian trade cloth, imitation check. Uh, you can see it's patchwork design. Um, and increasingly a much more naturalistic floral pattern. These were um, favoured by European and Eurasian plants in the Dutch colonies throughout Java and Sumatra or all over. Uh, then we come to the next section and I would say by the 1920s European and Eurasian women abandoned wearing this as, as um, world culture entered sort of the modern era and the jazz age and art deco. This I suppose became, was considered too 
too old fashioned and you know, not really modern. Although I see to me they they have a lot of modern elements in them already. Um, then we come to the next section, which is the, the dawn of the, the Chinese kabaya. The, uh, just as European women abandoned wearing the sarong kabaya, the Chinese Puranakan ladies in Java picked it up and stopped wearing the baju panjang and in imitation of European style, um, wore lace kabaya. Um, the, 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 the Dutch kabaya makers as well as the Chinese kabaya makers, uh, batik makers, started to produce uh, cloths and sarongs more to this European taste. So for example, this is made by a Chinese, but signed by a Chinese batik maker. But here he has copied the, the motifs of faith, hope and charity. Mm -hmm. But he's thrown in more Chinese taste flowers like the jessamum, uh, peony. And over here, this is an interesting example. This was made by a Eurasian batik maker, Elisa and Zoyla in Kalongan. For the Chinese client, you can see the swastika motif behind. And here you can see the kabaya uh, becoming much more towards Chinese taste. Dragon, front and back. This is the one with the dragon that we uh, sent for our show in Paris that I was talking about. Uh, like slim tea, uh, Peter was talking about, matched by uh, a sarong by one of the top and uh, most well known batik makers yes, of that time. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, over here, um, right in the centre of the uh, floor is uh, what the piece I was mentioning to you about. Uh, it is the sarong with the chucky part. Um, it is, interestingly, as mentioned, made by Lian Metzler, a very um, uh, well-known Eurasian uh, batik maker. But you know she was obviously making for Pranakan Chinese uh, client because she chose to depict the chucky card, the favourite game for the Pranakan Chinese, uh, rather than the earlier design which was of poker cards. But she has kept to that colour of uh, red and blue, which was, uh, uh, which was uh, quite the same as the previous one that was produced just for uh, Dutch and Eurasian uh, clients in Indonesia. Uh, and of course, uh, we've matched it with a uh, kabaya that uh, shows the storyline of this part that you are in, because now you are in um, the uh, early 20th century, about 1910, um, 1920, and uh, this is when the Peranakan Chinese were emulating what the Dutch um, and Eurasian ladies were wearing in Indonesia, but starting to add a bit of their own uh, taste and making it more uh, catered to the Peranakan uh, sensibility. So, um, over here, um, this is uh, also another fantastic piece I would like to show. Um, again, you can see, uh, this is amazing because of course the Peranakan um, batik makers, uh, they were known to add colour to batik sarong because they, um, they were the first to experiment with chemical dyes. Uh, in the early 20th century, so you can start to see, if you just look at the sarong, how the colours uh, have uh, trans uh, transitioned from being the more muted tones to the more colourful tones. And this one is so interesting because it tries to, uh, it is chemical dyes but mimicking um, natural dyes, and right in the front uh, of the case, the capella, it actually again features the tamblan or the patchwork motifs that we have seen all the way the centuries before in Indian uh, trade textiles. And over there is what uh, Peter and I would think would be the kids' favourite. It's uh, Batik Sarong featuring uh, the story of Cinderella. Um, they call it Batik Fairy Tale. So you can see uh, Cinderella here with a glass slipper. Behind her, the clock that strikes midnight. And I think maybe, unfortunately, we have wrapped the Prince Charming inside. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is probably will be the kids' favourite. Um, and interestingly, uh, actually, this is a more rare piece because the one that was more... Um, um, the, the fairy tale that was most uh, popular, popularly ordered and commissioned was actually a little red riding hood. So um, over here uh, we have uh, Cinderella instead. There are also other tales like uh, Sleeping Beauty and other uh, classics. So um, we move on now. Uh, okay, over here we have some, we have a wall of uh, uh, batik that is produced by the Chinese batik makers. So uh, the other wall that Peter was showing earlier were made by the Dutch and um, the Dutch and Eurasian batik makers. So uh, over here, um, because of course when they are wrapped up, you can't really see the design. We wanted to show the Chinese or Pranagan Chinese batik makers' contribution to uh, the evolution of the style of, China, uh, of batik. 
So um, obviously, uh, all these are one by front event journey. Uh, over here, we have um, an example um, opened up by uh, a well-known batik Chinese maker. And uh, you can see she, she has chosen, again, it's a hybrid of different cultural influences. In the background of the button of the body, you see again the swastika motif, all the way from what we have seen upstairs. And yet, uh, we have paired it with this classic, uh, very European uh, motif, what we call the bouquet or the bouquet time motif. Um, and in this part, as you moved on, you also noticed that uh, uh, flora motifs became quite a favorite among uh, especially the Pranagan Chinese uh, clientele. So they move away from what their uh, grandmothers wore, which is uh, the Baju Panjang with, and, and Sarok with a lot of geometric uh, motifs, into the more uh, naturalistic uh, flower uh, design. So uh, you can notice also just, um, I think the exciting thing that Peter and I would like to show in this show is how uh, the style can change in a matter of decades. So even in previous shows, uh, they have broad categorization, but over here we have, uh, this is 1910s, 1920s, and now we move to the 1930s, 40s, and it ends in the 50s, 60s. So what happened in 20 years? So we come to the 1930s where um, the sarong really burst into um, a variety of colors and of uh, very, uh, as over there you can see dark and dramatic red and blue and over here beautiful uh, pastel, uh, pastel shades. And look at the, you know, kabayas they have, um, with the invention of, um, with the popularity of uh, the Singer sewing machine, the sewing machines in the 30s, um, the kabayas have become uh, such works of art um, with the introduction of uh, very, very exquisite uh, lace work, um, I mean sewing machine work. So. Um, yeah, Peter always, of course, also, um, we discussed about how the sewing machine was, of course, meant to uh, free women from the laborious chore of uh, sewing, uh, but it has actually uh, <laughs> entailed the women to actually come up with more and more intricate manner of making um, the bias. Right? So this is actually rope lace and um, very uh, cleverly mixed with uh, sewing machine uh, uh, style embroidery. So um, over here, maybe I'll show you. Yes. Uh, the very interesting thing we want to show sometimes is also uh, cultural nuances. So Peter earlier showed this blue and white um, piece in, uh, worn by the Dutch and Eurasian ladies in uh, Indonesia. Over here we also have a blue and white, but this one was uh, probably uh, for a Pranakan Chinese client because again, the choice of uh, the sentiments for example. Uh, but interestingly, blue and white for the Pranakan Chinese by the early 20th century was uh, associated as mourning colours. So this combination would only have been more for mourning uh, or during funerals. Um, another interesting piece I would like to show, oh, okay, maybe right here. Uh, again, on the story of the Basic development, in the 1930s, uh, the Kain Sanjang or the long skirt cloth uh, also became more popular. Well, generally, the Pranakan Chinese wore more sarong, the tube skirts that you see. But um, the long, the kind of engine or the long skirt cloth came back into popularity around the 30s. And this is a particular form known as the pagisore or the morning uh, evening batik. So it's very fascinating because you see that the motifs here are inverted. And this one is the right side up because you can actually wear wear this by both sides and um, it's actually an economic, uh, very functional division, a uh, very interesting slant that you see here such that the lady can wear one side in the morning and the other side at night. Um, I think also from this piece it tells the story of how uh, by the 30s the Chinese batik makers were making um, batik that were of such exquisite uh, a very fine detail, so you really have to step up to really see the descent or the um, very fine uh, fillers in every um, in every uh, design, such that it makes them look uh, quite lifelike, actually. Is this the museum collection? Oh. Um, this piece, uh, no, this one we borrowed from uh, Peter. Peter's family collection. Yes, there are quite a few that we borrowed. So, so um, over here, uh, you will see in this platform, perhaps maybe the most striking one is the one in the pink kabaya. She's the only one in a pastel pink uh, shade, um, wearing a kind, she's actually wearing a puggy story, so quite like what you see up there, but we have uh, wrapped it in. So, um, 
taste of pink and green, perhaps this is a combination that is more common, commonly associated with Sopranicans. Um, actually, in this period, uh, as Peter has mentioned, we wanted to show how actually even sing, uh, women in Singapore uh, and uh, Malacca and uh, in the street settlements, they did continue to wear lace as well, because that's one of the surprises we hope to give to the community uh, that they might, you know, uh, looking at the title of the show, Old Style Kabaya, they might come in ex expecting immediately an explosion of colours, but as you walk through, I think you've seen how it starts with the blue and red of the Indian trade cloth, and then the muted dyes, and how it looks, and how colour is actually uh, ex uh, slowly introduced. So this is one of the... Um, that, uh, so this is the only one on this platform for a reason, uh, matched with uh, match by uh, match with uh, batik sarong from uh, by a very famous uh, Chinese batik maker known as Wee Sojun. Uh, they are they are fine, but uh, because we have wrapped them, you can't really see because usually the signature is hidden inside. So that's why we unroll a few that you can see the, the signature. So uh, finally, we end uh, with the 50s. And have I left out anything? <laughs> yeah. So um, finally, we end in the 50s and uh, the 50s and 60s, whereby of course some of uh, the combinations you see here would be more uh, familiar with the public today. Uh, we've got the kind of combinations that you might see in the little nonia, for example, brighter and bolder colours. But what we wanted to say in this show is to historicize the costume, and it's only in the 50s and 60s that you really start to see. Uh, this very varied uh, color coming in, and at the same time, uh, the very um, the big uh, floral motifs that are so common today. Uh, you can see the big floral motifs uh, near the clothing. These are uh, all uh, things that became more popular uh, only in the 50s and uh, 60s. So um, over there in the corner, we have this blue kabaya um, with um, yellow sarong that was also a piece that we brought to uh, the Al Irish show. Um, quite a fun piece actually, and I think it's uh, quite a good example of, uh, of some of the combinations that might have been found in the where they, uh, they experimented more with animal motors in general. So you can see most of the buyers actually have floral motors. But in Penang, you in the 50s, 60s, you start, start to experiment with like, uh, animal motives. And even, um, I think there's one in our permanent collection upstairs or laid down in the fashion corner. Uh, they also even have a uh, human figurine, uh, such as, I think, a very popular one of Bolero uh, dancers. So, um, this part, I think, as Peter will always um, will mention, uh, we like to end the show in this part because uh, it dates quite stylistically to what Veronica. Uh, ladies continue to wear today. Um, it's a bit of, I think, continuation and a, a bit of a surprise, we hope, that you can see we also try to show some uh, pastel combinations rather than just the, the bright and bold uh, combinations. Um, perhaps, uh, we, I think there are quite a few uh, reasons why maybe at this time Pranagan ladies uh, also um, turn away from the sound kabaya to other forms of costumes. Um, there are, of course, the introduction and the gradual acceptance, uh, the wider acceptance of our Western forms of clothing by the community uh, in general, and of course changing ideas of fashion of what is uh, popular. But we do hope today uh, that with this show opening, that um, with uh, surprises like lots of lace kabayas and the different motive shows that uh, somehow the exhibition can also continue to, uh, can inspire um, Ranakan today to uh, think about their costume and uh, what is uh, commonly known as Ranakan kabayas.